Okay, so which means that it is, everything is working because I wouldn't like to be talking and learn after that that in fact you couldn't see much. Okay, the way of sin. Don't think that it is a mistake on my part that this curve with the title is going downward. It is because it is, it is the way of sin and the way of sin has that direction. Um, my talk will be based on what Apostle James left us in his uh, James chapter 1, 15, which let me quote from two different King Jameses, the old one and the new one. The old one has it, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And the new King James has it, uh, well, in the modern version, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The reason for the talk is why the Apostle makes the difference between sin being brought forth and then being finished, as the old King James has it, uh, and sin being born and then being full grown, as the new King James has it. Or putting it differently, why is it that giving birth to sin, that is sinning, because we understand giving birth to sin is a sin, is an act of sin, why this act of sin is not followed by death, but there is another stage of sin, of sin being finished or full grown. What does it mean for sin to be finished or full grown? That's the question. Why do we have this extra stage? So let's have a look at the first part. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. The first, this, this first stage is when desire, and we understand desire as a strong feeling of wanting something, whatever that, whatever that may be. When desire, a strong feeling of wanting something, conceives, because sin always starts from desire, a selfish desire in our heart. And at that time, it is not sin yet. It is just like a human fetus. It is not a yet a human being, but needs about nine months to develop. At this early stage, it is just a thought, an operation of our mental faculties. What happens next depends on our will, with us either agreeing or disagreeing to such a thought. If we don't, if we don't agree, the thought dies out and away, disappears from our minds, which is the best option. If, however, we do agree and sympathize with the thought somehow, we keep it on in our mind and consider its various faces and connotations, usually very, very attractive to our old Adam, fallen Adam, it conceives a sinful fetus in our heart and starts pushing it toward a future birth. What is worth noting is that thoughts as such, no matter how sinful they are, never appear to us to be as sinful as words or actions they finally lead to. At that stage, we do not think we could say that or we could do anything like that, anything of the kind. The sooner we put a sinful thought to death, the easier it will be for us not to sin by word or by deed. If we allow an impure thought to, rem to remain in our minds long enough, it will contaminate our minds and hearts. It will start a fetus. And then we'll develop the fetus inside our hearts and finally will give birth to it in the form of sinful words or actions or both. Now the question, how long is it too long? How long is too long for a sinful thought to remain alive in our minds? Well, let's ask, how long did it take Jesus? He had sinful thoughts too, injected into his mind by Satan. How long did it take him to put them to death? No more than a second, I guess. They didn't even have a chance to conceive anything in his mind or in his heart. We sinful creatures in many cases cannot be that quick. But at least let's try to do it before a sinful thought gets out of our mouths and employs our hands or legs. The closer we destroy it, this thought, to the moment of conception, the more certain it is that we will not sin. Because the longer a sinful desire stays in us, remains in us, the stronger it becomes and the weaker we become to resist it. That's a psychological rule. Even modern day psychologists understand that and present it in this way. The longer you think about doing whether to do something or not do it, you will do it. Now, let's have a few biblical, biblical examples of desire conceiving and giving birth to sin. So by seeing that example, we can get some lesson for ourselves. 
The first one will be, of course, Lucifer, for whom the, the sinful and selfish desire conceiving a sin was ambition to be somebody, to be a great one, admired and respected, preferably to the same degree, if not higher, than God himself. It appeared in his heart at one point of his existence, we don't know exactly when, and had been developing in him for some time until it was finally born in the Garden of Eden in the act of deceiving Eve, so as to get for himself a dominion over which he could reign like God and as a God, the God of this world. The next one will be, of course, Eve, the one kind of deceived by Satan. In her case, sin conceived because she desired more knowledge than God had given her. If we turn to Genesis 3, we can see that a sinful fetus had been developing in her for some time and could easily have been aborted without being born at all, had Eve been willing to obey God's prohibition. Instead, she preferred to observe the snake eat the forbidden fruit, probably on many different occasions, more than one occasion. Then she spent some time, probably a lot of time, thinking how clever the snake was, even the most crafty and cunning of all animals, with Satan suggesting to her mind that the reason for this must be the fruit God had forbidden them to eat, but did not forbid Satan to do so. The mental process must have taken place in her mind many, many times before she finally reached out and tasted the fruit. Our illustration number three is Adam. The whole process in his case probably took much less time than, than with Eve. Because we read in Genesis 3, 6, she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So it was as long as the act of giving and reaching out, taking the fruit and eating it. It could have lasted just a minute, maybe less than that. With him, the selfish desire conceiving sin was his reluctance to live without Eve. Though it's hard to say whether it sprang from his love to Eve or to himself, because after all, it would have to be him who would have to live alone again should Eve, be, should, should Eve die uh, as a result following in the wake of her sin. Our example number four is, of course, uh, Cain. We cannot leave him out of our picture. What was it that conceived and later gave birth to his sin? Jealousy, envy, noticed by God in Cain's heart, which led God to to warning him in Genesis 4, 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it or control it. Sin lying at the door hadn't been born yet. It was after the stage of conception, on the way to, well, to be prepared for birth. So it was a fetus, developing inside his heart. And it needn't have been born, needn't have been born at all, um, but Cain could and should have killed this desire in his heart, this desire to slew his own brother. How, Cain, however, let it grow stronger and stronger all the way from conception to birth without taking any action suggested by God in his warning. Do we have any more demonstrations of the same process in the Bible? Plenty of them, but I will have just two more because I want to have six. As Bible students, you know why I want to have six examples, because six is a perfect example for imperfect, for imperfect cases. So I, will have, I have picked up only uh, six different cases to show how sin conceives in, our, in one's heart is not stopped, is not killed, is not aborted on the way to birth, but goes all the way through from conception to birth and is manifested outside through sinful words or sinful actions, deeds. So back to our case with David. Um, David, of course, left us two different stories of serious sins. It was adultery and murder. The first one was the result of his love of the opposite sex, of his sexual desire, and the other of a desire to hide his guilt, to evade responsibility for his sin of adultery. Let's see how his sexual desire conceived and gave birth to his first sin, that of adultery. Second Samuel 11, 
2 through 4. One evening, David arose from his um, uh, bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Then David took her and she came to him and he lay with her. The things I have put in bold show the, the time spent by David, David conceiving his sin. That, that was the time this sinful desire conceived in his heart and could have been stopped, could have been aborted. It was at least a matter of a few days because he saw the woman first then he sent some messengers who wanted to inquire about her. Maybe it happened on the next day. Maybe it took him two or three days. We don't know. Then he sent some messengers to invite her to the palace. And she came. Maybe she came immediately. Immediately. Maybe she didn't. Maybe she needed two or more days, three days to do that. Anyway, it took him at least a few days. And the fetus was developed. The sin was committed. Uh, what about his other sin? Because uh, that's not the only one he left on the pages of the Bible of himself. It, it continues in the, send, in the same book, Second Samuel, in the same chapter, from starting from verse 5. And the woman conceived, so she told David. Then David sent to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And when Uriah had come, David said, go down to your house. But Uriah didn't go down to his house. So David said to Uriah, why did you not go down to your house? The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? Then David said to Uriah, wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk and at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord but he did not go down to his house in the morning david wrote a letter to joab and sent it by the hand of uriah saying set uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die that was his other sin how long did it take for this sin of david's to be born to go all the way from conception to birth? Well, at least again, a few days, if not, if not weeks. Because first, he had to send uh, a man with a message to his general Joab, out there somewhere. Then Uriah needed some time to get back home from the battlefield. Again, a matter, it, it, was not, it was not as quick as it is today. Okay, well, at least a few days, probably, again. And then at least three more days of making Uriah, of encouraging Uriah to go back home to spend uh, some time with his wife, spend the night with his wife. Uh, his attempts to make Uriah drunk so that he wouldn't think <laughs> about his duties as a soldier and about his uh, companions in, uh, yes, uh, in the field fighting with the enemy. Uh, because uh, by doing this, David wanted to hide his guilt, his sin of uh, adultery. He wanted the baby to be born to be considered Uriah's, not David's, not David's. But because Uriah refused, because Uriah wouldn't go home, no matter how drunk he was or how, how drunk uh, David made him to be, he, he couldn't conceal his sin and the sin was out. Our last case is, of course, uh, Judas whose sin was conceived partly by greed and partly by pride, manifested in his attempt to control, to assume control of Jesus by making him do what uh, Judas had planned out for him. That is, by making him call a host of mighty angels to prevent his being arrested and later executed. Judas didn't, pro probably didn't believe that Jesus would do nothing to prevent his own arrest and execution. He knew Jesus was the Son of God. He realized that he could summon, call a lot of mighty angels to defend him from anything. And, and had Jesus wanted that, he would have done it. But of course, Jesus was here to die, and the time had come for him to die, so he wouldn't do anything of the kind. Still, Jesus, Judas had the, the courage, had the courage to assume, to try to assume control of Jesus' life. 
With him, the time needed by Sin to be born was probably the second longest of all the six of our illustrations after Lucifer's. Probably with Lucifer it was, we don't know how long, we don't know how long, I guess years, maybe even light years, we don't know that. Uh, but, uh, but, um, but as far as Judas is concerned, we know from uh, John, yes, I, the quote is here in my presentation, that uh, even during uh, Jesus' um, three and a half days, during uh, while they were together, Judas was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take, steal, what was put in it. So if he was like that even before um, going to the priests and... Uh, pointing who Jesus was, it shows something of his character. It implies that uh, the sinful fetus must have been developing in him for many, many months, maybe for a year or maybe even for more than just one year. Now on to the second part of what uh, the Apostle James left us. And uh, yes, because we want to understand this big question, why? And already born, brought forth sin, by word or act, doesn't matter, that why this sin, the act of sin, does not deserve to be punished by, with death. We know the, the, the biblical rule that says that the wages of sin is death. Why does sin, as sin, have to go through an extra stage of somehow being finished before it can be punished with uh, its wages, death. So, the second part, and sin, when it is finished or full grown, depending on which James, we, which King James we prefer, brings forth death. So, let me say it loud and clear, and let me put it also here on the screen, that a born sin, an executed sin, a brought forth sin, does deserve death punishment. Because if it didn't, the principle of God's justice would be violated. And there's no violation to God's justice. An executed sin, a sinful act by word or by action is punished with death. And there's no doubt about that. The best examples are Adam and Eve, who were punished for their sin directly or immediately on committing it. So how come the apostle mentions this extra stage here? Mm -hmm. It's all it's all because of Jesus' ransom sacrifice, which frees the sinner from the penalty for Adamic sins, because Jesus took the punishment on himself, and as man will forever remain in the grave, so that the real sinner can one day be let out of the prison of death. It is only thanks to Jesus' ransom that sinners conceiving sins in their hearts and later giving birth to them with our words and actions, do not have to suffer the ultimate penalty. Only thanks to Jesus' ransom, the situation is a little different. There is an extra stage for sin, which becomes somehow finished or full grown. Uh, however, however, sinners or a sinner can still die for his sin, and many will die for their own sins, but only for finished sins, as the, uh, uh, as the Apostle says, or full-grown sins. So now we ask this question. What kind of sin is finished or full-grown? What happens then, or what makes a sin finished or full-grown? And then death comes and there is no return, there is no ransom, there is no way back. When it comes, when it is finished or full-grown, nothing can stop God from executing such a sinner. So what kind of sin is finished or full grown? One that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be separated from the sinner, cannot be killed without killing the sinner in the process. When sin hardens so much, it is impossible to break it, when it, is, when it becomes fully crystallized and unchangeable. Then it is finished, then it is full grown. <clears throat> I will now show you a mm, very fine definition of crystallization. Yes, fully crystallized, fully unchangeable. Crystallization from PT 1964. <clears throat> Doesn't matter when, you've got the reference anyway. Crystallization of character would be, would be the process of making the mental, moral, and religious quality of one's cultivated disposition <clears throat> unbreakable. 
It may be unbreakable in good and against evil, or it may be made unbreakable in evil and against good. <clears throat> Jesus' character is an example of the former kind, and Satan's character of the latter, latter kind. <clears throat> Sorry, some water because <clears throat> something in my throat. <clears> throat> So here is a very fine definition of crystallization, and then nothing can be done. Our character can be crystallized positively and negatively, can be crystallized upward and downward, made unbreakable in evil and against good, and then it is, and then it is full, finished, it is full grown. How can one make that character unbreakable in evil and against good? How does it happen? So that we don't do it, it's better to know so as not to do it, by <clears throat> sinning against light, against better knowledge, by doing evil without feeling any remorse, by not trying to make things right, by not seeking forgiveness, all of which slowly but surely results in one losing all ability to repent at all. And if the sinner cannot repent, God cannot forgive, no matter how heavy, or how light any, any given sin is. Repentance is prerequisite for God forgiving the sinner. No repentance, no forgiveness. Now, another, another question. Does one have to be spirit begotten in order to reach that stage of crystallization, unbreakability, in, in, in um, evil against good? Um, yes. No, not at all. We don't have to be spirit begotten in order to reach that stage. Why not? Because people in the millennium and in his little season will reach that stage without spirit begotten. Because Judas reached it in this life without being begotten of the spirit. Because according to Jesus, some Pharisees must have reached that stage. Because Jesus said of them, how can you flee from the judgment of the Gehenna, Jehina, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, is the G or G at the beginning in English. And even David, even David was in danger of reaching that stage of crystallization, of crystallization this negative crystallization in, yes, in evil against good. Had he not repented when confronted with his sin by Nathan? I have another quote. It doesn't mean that uh, because only because it was in the PT it must be true, but it sounds true. It rings true because it's according to to, uh, to God's uh, rules, principles. And what do we read there? If he, David, had not repented from his wayward cause, but had continued to follow it, he would have lost his ancient worthyship and eventually, in the millennial age, life itself. So with the great company members and you full worthies. If they practice sin and continue in it unrepentant, they will lose their position of favor, favor with God and eventually life itself. And there's no mention here of the great company, yes, uh, great, sorry, uh, consecrated epiphany campus, I mean. There's no mention of consecrated epiphany campus, but can we expe expect that their case, our case, is uh, much different? If we sin and do not repent, we harden our hearts. If anyone sins and does not repent, he or she, they harden their hearts. And if we harden, the, harden our hearts too much, it may be impossible to break them without breaking our whole character. Just like removing a stain from a piece of clothing sometimes involves getting rid not only of the stain, but also of the garment, of the garment as such. So, whenever a sinful desire conceives in us, let us kill the fetus, either the moment, the moment it appears, which would be the, the option to be recommended, much, much to be preferred, preferable, or as close to its conception as possible, as close to its conception as possible. But, but if we fail, because fail we will on a number of occasions, Otherwise, we would be close to perfection. But if we fail and a sin is born, then do as quickly as possible another thing. Let's repent as soon as possible, so as not to let it, to not to, not to let sin become finished, become full grown 
making our characters unbreakable in evil and against good. One more question and the answer to it and uh, we will be done. What was it that uh, made new creatures crown losers or crown retainers? We know that the new creatures were finally divided when it, when it came to that judgment. They were divided into the two such categories. Was it uh, sin with the former, with the crown losers, and no sin with the latter, no sin with crown retainers? That was the difference between them? That was what made them crown losers or crown retainers? That some of them sinned and the others did not? No. Not at all. For all creatures except Jesus did sin, did sin, and that many, many times on many different occasions. The distinguishing factor was completely different. The disting distinguishing factor was the attitude after sinning. With the little flock repenting the moment they realized they had sinned, and the, and the great company remaining unrepentant. How long? Well, maybe forever. But God didn't want to let them remain unrepentant forever. So until God forced them into repentance, because God realized that being spirit begotten, they wouldn't have another chance in the millennium, along with the rest of uh, rest of mankind. And God wanted to save as many of them as possible from dying the second death, which in, in many cases was to no avail after all. In many cases, in some cases, it was successful. That's That's how this class uh, of people, this group of people, uh, the great company, came into being in the first place. It was, they were new creatures that were desperately, I might say, saved by God from dying the second death, only because they sent and didn't want, didn't feel it necessary, didn't feel like re repenting. So God, so God said, I will force you to repent, and maybe, and maybe you will get cleaned. Maybe you will become purer than you are. But even if you do, you will never get back to, to what you had, to what you lost. But at least you will save life so as by fire, as the Bible has it. And that's all. And that's all for me. I am on time. So thank you for uh, your attention. And let those few words make us uh, sin-proof, resistant to sin and when we do sin uh, let's follow this way repent as soon as possible let us not allow sin harden us become finished become full grown crystallize us make us unbreakable in evil and against good thank you